So thanks for the introduction. Um, so yes, uh, the company I'm representing is LucidWeb and today we have launched uh, the European VR landscape together with Marco uh, of the VR fund. Another big news today is uh, Shintaro. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the news? Yeah. So we called the next uh, launched the new fund this uh, the end of last last month. So Colopella VR fund two uh, is investing in a whole jam in VR and AR, and uh, for uh, Colopella VR fund one. We invested in mostly in the U.S., but we noticed that there are many good companies in outside U.S. So right now we more focused on outside U.S. like Europe or Middle East and Asia, Asian VR startups uh, in VR Fund Two, and the size is up to 50 million dollars. So totally we have now 100 million dollars VR Fund dedicated fund. That's, uh, that's great news for the industry, I guess. Um, Daniel, um, can you talk about um, your, your fund, of course, and a couple of uh, investments in VR? Sure. Um, so I'm Daniel from Crandom, and we're an early stage VC firm based in Stockholm, San Francisco, and uh, soon Berlin. Um, and we invest across early stage companies in various sectors, but including games. Um, I think we've done two investments that were categorized as VR related. One is uh, in a tech company called 13 Labs that Oculus acquired uh, a couple of years back. Another one is one of the companies on this list called Resolution Games, which is a, a games content company um, founded by Tommy Palm, who was one of the guys behind Candy Crush from King. Marco, can you uh, also describe one of the uh, investments you have done in, in VR or VR gaming? Yeah, so Marco Demaraz from the Venture Reality Fund or the VR Fund. Again, thanks to Lean and her partner for putting this landscape together. They went over 300 companies in Europe and selected the ones that we thought would fit uh, our common criteria. Again, sorry for missing some of you guys. We get a lot of emails saying, hey, how come you didn't include us? My partner, Tipitat, has a criteria. It has to be the company has to have some funding and they have to have some product in the market. So if you have any complaints, please send it to Tipitat, not to me, and not to Lean either. Uh, but really, we're excited about the robust and dynamic landscape in Europe. Uh, we are fun. We started the fund about a year ago, and we've been very fortunate to have great investors like actual Global Next, and, uh, and really have built a portfolio of game and non-game companies. And the company that you're referring to, in our game portfolio, we have five uh, companies. And two of them are known public, the three of them will be announced soon. But the two of them are, one is Alchemy, which has Job Simulator, which was a top money maker in VR last year. Job Simulator made $3 million. Number two was Raw Data, the two and a half million. And which is a great sort of starting point for VR that didn't really have much of a install base. So for Alchemy, Job Simulator, and the other company against Gravity Rec Room, those two are doing extremely well. Our, choice for, uh, you know, I think they chose us more than we choose them because uh, we've been following them. We really wanted to be part of their adventure and, and journey. For, you know, we're coming from the gaming back background as well. So for us, Job Simulator had very interesting mechanics. When you think about it, how could that be really fun? You know, you're, you're working in your cubicle and then doing some stupid stuff, right? That can't be really that much fun. Those guys really come up, came up with great mechanics to make it incredibly fun and engaging and with great retention dynamics. So we play the game, we love the game, and we really wanted to join their uh, funding. Eventually they had many, many choices and we were really fortunate to be included. But it was really based on the quality of the game experience that we saw. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, Juan, you have a bit of a different uh, profile on stage. Um, oh yeah, I feel really poor right now because <laughs> I, I don't give any money. I, I'm not representing a fund. I'm representing, you know, the people that are uh, coaching and accompanying the startup in the field, and so that are the ones struggling, you know, getting the funds and getting the attention. That's also very, very valuable. Um, can you explain? You're, all, you're based in Brussels, uh, but you're tra traveling in Europe and internationally to conferences. Do you see um, many differences uh, across regions uh, related to funding? 
Yeah, I mean, it's uh, Europe is a bit of a hotball. I like to compare, the, you know, the startup scene to the, you know, VR scene. Uh, in, in Europe, a lot of the organization funding, they would wait to see results first, traction first, before, you know, considering investing uh, in an organization. There are no uh, VR specialized funding in Europe yet, so nobody has, you know, called out to say we specifically, uh, 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 you know, look for that area. So the, the venture part hasn't yet awoken to uh, the potential of VR and, and AR. And then the traditional way of funding video games, all those cultural funds and uh, all those uh, local and regional funds, uh, they all look at VR in a, in a very peculiar way because they have been so much used to understanding the lever between the investment and the economic return of specific games or activities. Then when look at VR, they, they're not sure that they're going to be able to create economic activity, that they're going to be able to create jobs. So there's a strong hesitation on the cultural side, and there's a, a very little European venturing into the uh, uh, within Europe. And so, luckily, there are you know the VR funds, Colopol, uh, uh, Gumi. I mean, there's a lot of those very active companies that are on the lookout for projects. But then my fear as being a European is that we will miss again the train. You know, all great talents, all great content will be supported from uh, uh, outside funding. And so hopefully, uh, you know, we'll, we'll advocate really hard for other players to have. And part of the approach I really like with the VR fund is that they're always looking for a local partner to co-invest. And so, you know, the education, the let it, taking uh, local partners by the end, making sure that they, they understand that the risk is being shared between, you know, foreign funding and local funding is a great way to reassure uh, the, lo the local community and the local activities. And I think approaches like that is great because suddenly European ventures and investment funds, they're all being educated on the potential of VR, uh, which I think it's quite important. Yes, um, that's, uh, that's clear. Uh, if you look at regions, uh, are there regions in your opi opinion that are stepping up in this game uh, on the level of public funding or is the whole of Europe a bit the same? Uh, you know, it, it, all, it all becomes part of a critical mass. Uh, I like to take the story of Lille, which of all places around Europe wasn't really known for gaming. And as soon as there was like one major success, it spins off people that decide to start their own game studio, and then success brings success. And you have like this nice machine of activities going on. So initiative like you know the VR base uh, to you know put together lots of expertise, lots of people into one location. Hope that some of them raise up, creating those local ecosystem where you know there's public-private partnership, there's funding available, there's expertise, there's training. You know, those are some of the ecosystems that are spurring. The Nordics are getting really well organized in, in, in that field. Like Finland is a great example of, uh, of activities coming together. You know, uh, the Netherlands, you know, Germany has some nice ecosystem. Uh, Poland is, uh, is increasing their activities. So uh, um, Spain, of all country now, has also developed quite a, quite a few activities. So I, I believe because it's still very early and because it's risk, Unless, you know, there's a really understanding from the government side, from the private side, that there's opportunity in the field, um, you know, it, it's going to be really hard for lonely developers to develop their activities. Uh, there's, there's still one story that is well known about Olivier JT in Paris, feeling like there's a desert uh, happening in his, in his environment and having him to go, you know, abroad to export his expertise. Uh, it's a little less true today, but there's still some sort of reality that there are some uh, some dislocation okay thanks for sharing um, then maybe a question for the group um, there are a couple of uh, business models uh, working in vr gaming uh, as an investor do you have a preference do you have uh, experience with companies that you can recommend uh, to the people in the room so actually for gaming company uh, just the most important thing is just we 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 can enjoy or not so, for, for due diligence phase, our team members uh, play a lot for game. So if, we, if, if most of our team members can enjoy the game, we will, we will go, go so further. 
so it's less about free to play um, uh, if you have to one time so at this time most most companies are uh, not free to play because market is still early so uh, paid so preference for paid, paid. is mm, it's still early in the market mm. so I think my, my take is that um, I mean for and that goes for any VR company the the challenge now initially is to to create engagement to create the habits of using VR on a regular basis that goes for no, no matter what uh, what's part of, of, of VR you're in, I think. Um, so engagement uh, is, is number one at the moment. When it comes to, to business models, I think there are almost like two paths. We'll, we'll see about subscription. I think that comes uh, further down the road. Um, at the moment, I think there's a short-term opportunity to tap into the, um, uh, the more hardcore gamers with the paid, paid model. Uh, but still, the pressure is downwards in, in these stores as well with free offering and a hard time for gamers to, you know, to, before they've tried it, to, to know if it's worthwhile the money or not. Um, and I think um, currently the volumes are too small to merit sort of a free-to-play business model if you're, uh, if you're after revenues. Um, so Resolution Games that we invested in, they take a long stand on this. Um, they have free-to-play, they have a free-to-play offering coming, <clears throat> coming from Counter Crush and, Mo and, and King. Of course, that's, that's a core, core uh, skill set they have. Um, and also where we're taking the approach that when, you know, when we reach you know, mainstream adoption, I think free-to-play is going to be a very legit business model. Um, and like on mobile, it's not something you learn from day one. Um, it goes into a lot of how you design the core, the core mechanics and things like that. So I think our view on that is, is, is that it's better to start early learning that if you can afford it. Um, and the other aspect is the, um, the um, learning about the, the game experience. Um, and where actually having a wider install base is, is um, preferred in our mind. Um, so, you know, if you have a premium offering, like you're gonna have a smaller install base, yes, you'll generate some revenue, but if you have a free offering, there are you know, more, more games to learn from. Um, and given that we have in total a pretty small limited um, install base, I think that's an important thing. So resolution for, with the first game, I think they recently announced more than a million uh, installs, which is for a, well, we can argue about the market size, but it's a, pretty big penetration where they are able to you know, get data, measure data, see what works and what doesn't to create this sort of strong engagement and habit type uh, experiences. So um, um, it, it takes for a different kind of funding. You cannot do it if you're self-funded. You, know, you will have to have runway, which uh, might be you know, even, even challenging for, for some. Um, but we look at it from that point of view that further down the road, it might be a, a winning model um, and no, it's a company which also raised money to be able to, to play a long game. I think at this stage, um, as uh, Yamakami-san was saying, it has to be fun. It has to be amazing because unlike a rectangular experience on your phones and, and PCs and, and consoles, it's a spherical experience. A lot of great designers haven't been able to express their great ideas in, in this new medium. So what we're looking for is a game that really amazes you either with through novelties and new mechanics or the environment, but it has to have some retention and engagement capabilities, which really comes from the fun that you draw, right? If you, if you don't really enjoy it, you're not coming back. So the traditional retention engagement dynamics have to be there, but for us, you know, the design or, or game experience that really takes advantage of the spherical medium it has to be really amazing. In terms of business models, let's go back to mobile gaming. Mobile gaming was a, a premium-driven model till the summer of 2011. 2011 summer, there were 100 million smartphones, primarily iPhones, and then second half of 2011, the business model flipped to freemium. So you have to have the critical mass to, to really use the, the freemium. So we're nowhere near there. At this point, I think what we're looking for is some premium engagements, like the job simulators, you know, they do money either through you know, unit sale or through bundling in HDCs or you know, PSVR and so forth. So I think we're, going, we're not going to be close to doing you know, monetizing from the freemium model, but the premium should be around for the next 24 uh, months or so. In the meantime, I think Daniel was talking about our suggestion to game developers is like learn a lot about the user behaviors because it's entirely new medium and audio matters, right? When you're playing mobile game, you don't care about the sound. You can play it without the sound. In VR, audio matters. If somebody's attacking you from behind, you want to know about it. 
if you guys watch in a story is like like invasion people get lost in the mountain and then the spaceship comes in the meantime and they completely miss that experience so you really have to but it's an incredible uh, you know story so you have to really think very different almost like drop the things that you know and think about the real life experience for the VR game and then express it and, and go out there and learn iterate like crazy and and on the funding side, be extremely frugal because it's going to take a while to ramp up the revenues. As Marco said, uh, for one year, many developers learn a lot about the VR game. It's, it's a very new. So, uh, for example, there's a WAP, WAP, WAP method. So, just one hour, one hour ago, there are many games we, we feel motion sickness yep. because of movement. But uh, the warp function ki kind of put the bottom and jumping to the other space. Warp function can solve that motion sickness. So like that, uh, gradually we know the better way in VR game. So maybe this year some company, a certain company can have the big hit <coughs> by using cumulative te technique of VR game, we hope. We hope to see the big hit in VR game, in VR market. So um, Marco was mentioning about not being uh, too frugal um, with, with funding at the beginning. Uh, and, and you just talked about you know, creativity and movement. There's one game that keeps on amazing me, and I don't know if you guys have tried it or, or know Dante, uh, it's Onward. Um, and, and being a, so it's a HTC, HTC Vive exclusive game. It's a one man developer and he's, got, he's in the top 20 uh, most sold game on, um, on the HTC Vive. And recently I met a player that has spent more than 400 hours playing the game. And he's figured out you know, movement, he's figured out multiplayer, he's figured out how to do first person shooter, he's figured out how to do uh, you know, big maps and how to re engage players. You know, and that was a one guy uh, team. Now, of course, he's, he's moved to uh, Valve offices in Seattle, he's expanding some of his activity. But to me, being a startup coach, knowing that you know, one person's creativity or one small team creativity can help write the new codes, can help write the new uh, gameplay, uh, makes me extremely hopeful that you know, funding to some extent is the issue, but then you know, creativity and writing the new codes and making fun and, and, and immersive gameplay uh, is, uh, you know, there's, st there's still plenty of opportunities for uh, entrepreneurs to, uh, to uh, get a success uh, from you know, pure you know, genius or invention. And that's, that's quite, uh, quite inspiring, at least to me. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, what I also think could be interesting to discuss here on stage is, um, for example, Shintaro has a view on Japan versus U.S. versus Europe. Marco, uh, based in U.S., but but for the following months, more and more active in Europe. Um, how how do you see the regions uh, are different with each other from an investment point of view uh, in the level of VR and VR gaming? And same for you, Daniel. Um, Europe versus because also you're active in U.S. I can just talk about our experience. You know, frankly, we're just learning, and we're learning, and we're networking. Uh, you know, working with you, Juan, and Dan, and his team at VR Base, and and really other players. Uh, he's not listening to me, and uh, uh, <laughs> and you know, for us, there's so much creativity, so much you know, smart people in Europe, and 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 also, you know, European landscape is very different from North American landscape. You know, we were. You know, our companies right now, we have 17 companies in the portfolio, one in Japan, we just closed our first deal in Europe, we're not going to announce it, but we're really excited about it, and let the company announce first, and the rest is in North America, and Europe for us is, I think uh, you said it uh, earlier, we need a local partner, because we don't know the laws in Belgium, we don't know the laws in Finland, we don't know know the jurisdictions and capital gains treatment in certain countries. So we need a local partner. In this experience, uh, our, our most recent investment in, in Europe, we have two leading early stage venture funds in that country. So we relied on their ability to really educate us. And it, if it was Sweden, it could have been 
uh, Daniel's, you know, fund, because we don't want to learn a lot about what it takes to invest and get money out of Sweden. We rely on the local partner. So for us is European investment model is really network and really, you know, work with great thought leaders and, and find a local partner in that country knows a lot about the local legal frame and everything else. North America is much, much easier. Obviously, we have an established sort of uniform market. Japan, we have one investment in Japan. Again, we follow two leading investors in Japan for our investment. One was Coopal, the other one was Gray. You know, our model is partnership model, and the goal is really we help provide expertise in North America, and also we help provide expertise in VR and AR, but we'll rely on local partners in each uh, region. Actually, we, we launched the first fund last, last year, last January, so one year ago. And at that time, we think there are more interested companies in Japan. But so far, uh, we invested in total uh, about 35 companies, and 80% is in the US. And 10% is in Japan, and 10% is in Europe. For Japanese? <laughs> I disappointed that, <laughs> but actually, what could be what could be the reason that there are less uh, startups in Japan? Yeah, sorry. What could be the reason that there are less uh, startups? Yeah, because you know, uh, in Japan there are many big companies, so uh, it's rare for people to spin off, spin out from the big company. Okay. So it's so uh, most people don't change their job. It's more still. a cultural thing. Yeah, more cultural thing. Okay. So. There are many good talent in Japanese companies, but uh, they are, most of them are in existing big companies. Okay. They don't, uh, they don't uh, spin off from their, their companies. They innovate with, within the walls of the corporate. So okay. it's, it's, it's difficult to find start, good startups in Japan because good talents are in existing big companies. So it's, it's almost the... Uh, it's almost the opposite of the U.S. In the U.S., many good talent easily spin off from the big company and create new new company. And most companies are in San Francisco or Los Angeles in terms of PR. So relatively, it's easy to find good companies, good good U.S. companies, because and how we just go to the Bay Area. And how do you approach the European, European market? It's almost the same as Marco said. Okay. So we partner with a local venture capital mm -hmm. in the US. And also, yeah, <laughs> that's it. OK. Daniel? Yeah, I don't have a good view in terms of quality of, of uh, VR startups from Asia. We, we don't focus there. Um, so, it's, so from that perspective, it's, it's, it's more maybe a question of how developed uh, for example, VR is in China, where I think it's in in many cases it's it's much more developed than here in terms of the experiences that are available and the the level of investment that's gone into all kinds of stuff. Um, and the US, we haven't been actively looking that much either uh, when it comes to VR. So primarily Europe, I guess. Uh, we only done one investment to date, though, so it's it's still sort of not the the core focus, sort of VR alone. But I think. A um, couple of reflections, perhaps, also when I sort of look at where we see the more interesting VR stuff, and it comes a little bit back to the focus areas uh, as well. So I think what we've seen is that um, people that have been working in sort of PC and consoles, so more catering for the, the, the hardcore gamers, have been very, very excited about uh, jumping to VR. Uh, and I guess it's partly, of course, the, the, the fact that some of these more, I mean, of course, there are opportunities in, on these platforms too, but it's, it's a little bit flatline. It's not... Excitement hasn't maybe been on PC games or, or console games to the same extent as the mobile explosion. And here you get a new medium, you get a new platform, a new experience that you can you can interact um, with, and that you can start providing experiences to to the user group that has sort of been maybe waiting for something new and cool. Um, Nordic specifically is, is pretty mobile heavy. You know, you know some of the very successful companies coming out of there, Supercell King and others. Um, and there, I think. Um, fewer have jumped to ship to, to VR. Um, partly because it's not maybe the natural, um, the natural path from a, an audience point of view. Um, but we clearly saw resolutions stand out having, and coming from a, 
super experienced team on mobile and on, on console PC, but having that strong mobile component. And that was, some, was something that resonated extremely well in the US as well. So my, my feeling is that maybe they were um, seeing a similar, um, similar situation um, and, and not seeing too many of those sort of super high quality team going after more, more of the mobile VR opportunity. Um, Thanks. Uh, we've talked about uh, for, for the VR gaming uh, market and uh, the VR games that are out there that we are not reaching the critical mass yet and that we there are a lot of great content out there, but can you give some um, drivers or catalysts that could help um, get to the critical mass? I know it's a difficult question, but what could be enablers for this trend? We can go down. Um, it's, it's for, I think you have a two sort of sector dynamics. One is the mobile VR. The other one is console side, right? You know, uh, Vive and Rift and, and PSVR and so forth. If you look at the numbers uh, forecasted by various groups, super data and, and, and so forth, mobile VR needs volume, right? Mobile VR is very similar to mobile gaming. By the way, talking about mobile gaming, mobile gaming, when we were talking about, you know, 2011, five some years ago, it was two, three billion a year market. Right now, mobile gaming is 41 billion a year, the largest segment of 110 billion global gaming market. So the reason we are here and we want to invest in great you know, game developers, we think VR gaming could replicate that. Because you know, when you're in a VR game that is done right and you're fully immersed and then you, know, you really follow a story and, and in, enjoy and so forth, we think VR will have similar path. And so mobile VR part has to have critical mass. So that means Daydream has to ship in volume. And you have the, you know, Gear VR has to ship in volume. And HMD, you know, innovation has to happen. It has to be easier than what we have right now. And, and obviously, hopefully, Apple will do something and, and so forth. But shipment volume for this year is varying from 10 million to 20 million, depending upon whose data you look at. We really need to get to about you know, 50 to sort of 100 million a year shipments. That's, by the way, disclosure, I'm always an optimist and bullish on the sector. And I think it's going to happen faster than people think. But mobile VR needs volume. And on the high end side, I think the user experience has to be wireless. You can't be tethered, right? You have to have the inside out positional tracking so you can move around the room. You can enjoy the game in a free form, and the price points have to come down from 7.99 to sub, you know, 500 and sub 300, so that you know you have this purchasing power afforded by a lot of people to drive the high-end and business. So we're looking at both dynamics for mobile VR and console, you know, price reduction, quality of the games coming, and as well as you know, really the traction coming from the both you know Daydream platform as well as uh, what Apple might do. I, w I was work working at Microsoft the day that you know the Xbox 360 was installed, and that all online community and that lone multiplayer, and 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 this idea that oh you don't have an Xbox, oh too bad, you know we cannot play together. I mean this idea that there will be you know groups of friends, you know the hardcore gamer, you know wanting to be together on a similar platform, you know play competitively and and then bring others inspire them, you know some games becoming official esports and then I mean I I I see the the multiplayer side as a as a key driver of a, like some sort of social cohesion within group of people wanting to share similar experience. Earlier we were talking about some experience that bring both players that are not in VR and people in VR. So with one equipment, you can have you know, two people sharing the uh, experience, a little bit like the, the Wii U and the one that has the nice screen and the one that doesn't. I mean, this sort of intermediary uh, activities where the more people can share the medium together and see the value of feeling the other player's presence and, and doing a, a joint experience together, the, the, the more there's going to be incentive for people to make the investment themselves, you know, just to stay connected with their uh, group of friends. So I, I believe, you know, making VR as social as possible uh, can, be a, can be a driver of, uh, of adoption. Of course, price and all the rest. Uh. Um, yeah, no, fully subscribe to all, all your points, Marco. Um, and I think in, in maybe in addition, it's something, also touching on, on your points perhaps, that it's, given that it's, it's really sort of a, 
you have to experience type of thing, right? So it's you, you cannot watch a video of someone else playing it and, and really get the, the, the um, um, get the experience. So so that is a challenge, of course. And how do you bridge that? So um, and I think you know maybe maybe we'll see something similar to the well, I guess we see it in some places already. But as we discussed, Thor. Uh, about the arcade experiences where you sort of started playing your, your first video games back in the day. So I think, you know, I think, I think in a large extent and on, on some of the other mediums, um, the experience needs to be brought to the, the, to the users. You can't expect them just to go out and spend seven ninety nine and see if it was worthwhile. It's just, you know, that is too big of an ask, I think, from, for us towards, towards the consumers. Um, and then, you know, and, and, and I think your points again, Mark, were, were the most important ones, but there is also this, Let's call it like the halo moment, you know, when, when, when there was an experience that was so talked about that people actually went out, you know, eventually and went out to, to buy their Xbox, whatever, you know, because they wanted to play that game. That was the game, that was the coolest thing. Um, and we still haven't seen that yet. Uh, so I think there's still a, a lack on the content side, even I think it's, it's other drivers that needs to, to happen as well. Um, and <coughs> personally, I think VR uh, via, via takes more time than mobile. So actually, mobile gaming. So we have the uh, strong memory of mobile gaming because mobile game grow, grew rapidly. So only, only in five years, it's, it's get huge market. But, but I think it's because mobile is a must buy device for, pass, for, for each people. But uh, personally, I think VR is more similar to the PC or PC internet. So when we, we think, I think it's Marco know better more, but uh, maybe late 1990s, many people gradually have PCs and internet. And it, it took more time than recent mobile gaming uh, explosion. So I think VR market takes so gradually grow, mm -hmm. and not the same as mobile. Need to be a bit more patient, I guess. Um, we're coming close to the Q&A, so maybe uh, just a couple of last words, uh, just to recap what would be your tips for uh, game developers in the room that are looking for funding, um, public funding, investor funding. Uh, just a small recap, and then we give the floor to the audience. Okay, so I'll start. Um, and this is not specific, maybe tips for, for VR necessarily. Um, I think that characterize at least all our game investment. So uh, first of all, we invest in companies. Um, that means teams that are building something hopefully super interesting and exciting. Uh, but it's, it's more than, than the game that you're working on. Um, we're not funding game projects. Um, we love to have talented game developers in the teams, but there also need to be people who know how to build a company. Um, and that, that's sort of our starting point. Uh, and where I see m most of the time there's a mismatch between uh, game companies looking for funding and, and at least we as a VC is interested in that. Um, you know, I, I think there's, there's, um, there's very few companies that are, are right for VC funding at least. Because um, we have the expectations and, and partly Maybe it's the fault of the, the supercells in the king sort of world to, to you know, build very, very valuable companies. Um, so, so that would be my you know, more generic advice, I guess. And, and then on VR specifically, I think you mentioned Frugal. I think you know, we don't know when, when this is going to be mainstream. Um, we all, I think, believe that it will happen sometime. Um, but to not go overboard but, um, and, and spend the, the, you know, the funding or money you have but to, to to be ready to be pretty lean um, until, until we reach more of a uh, prime time for the market. Um, <clears throat> so I'll talk more on the, the public funding side. Um, one area that very often people overcome to look at when considering public funding to help support a gaming project is the R&D side necessary to you know, develop an experience or you know, push a technology forwards. And uh, we recently had in Belgium uh, an, an interesting experience with a company that was uh, bought by uh, Starbreeze. It's a company called uh, Nozone. 
um, they uh, went after public funding to develop a middleware they needed to develop one of their uh, VR experience. And uh, they got a lot of funding for developing that middleware, and then they've done great content. And then, you know, they, they managed to get interest from, uh, from Starbreeze to be a purchase in, in that way. So one is consider what is innovative in the content or the technology you develop and go after uh, R&D funding. Um, those are, you know, widely available mostly across Europe. The process is a bit long, it takes between three and six months. But then um, if you, you properly do it, uh, you can break through. And if you go and look for cultural funds, I think any VR enthusiast or VR developer also needs to be a VR evangelist. Um, and it's, uh, unless people have tried the technology, unless they know what good VR is, it's really hard to get people enthusiastic about the technology. So be an evangelist, educate your authorities, educate the funds, you know, go and meet them with your demo, with your headset, with your device, uh, because, uh, you know, seeing is believing in VR. So actually, I have the question to Daniel. So, <laughs> so yeah, in Europe, there are many, many, uh, much money for investment. So, you know, a few, a few months ago, uh, we have negative interest in, in mm -hmm. Europe. So there are plenty of money, but why uh, there are n not so many VC funds in Europe? In Europe? Or t yeah. Or yeah. Why oh, they, they, they don't take <laughs> <laughs> uh, degrees? Do we have? <laughs> Um, can so can you repeat the question? So, so, uh, I think the, the question is, in, in Europe we have a lot of money and negative interest rates. Why isn't more capital flowing into venture? Or, or investing in, in startups, um, which I think is a fair point. Um, and, and as I said, there's, there's many, many reasons for it. A, there is a lot more money now the last two years, three years than it has been before. So it, it, it really goes like this in terms of money being available. So there is an increased appetite, partly driven from the low or negative interest rates. Um, but Europe has been a, a more risk averse region than the US, for example. Um, maybe a bit similar to, to, to Japan, many big companies. Um, the, the, uh, the welfare state and the Europe security has been more, I think that's changing completely. So the explosion of startups is, is sort of driving more, more investments into it. Um, but it's, it's taking some time. And then there is the, the whole, uh, um, we had the, the boom in the late 90s and the big, big crash. And you know, it's taken a long, long time to get investors back to have appetite for venture. Um, so that was, that was a couple of years where there was, you know, pretty much impossible to raise a VC fund. Uh, now it's much easier because we have seen the, the great companies and the returns that bring, but um, yeah. Thank you very much. No worries. Actually, I think so, Marco, Marco's fund, the VR fund is very rare because most US VCs don't, don't go out from the US. True. So why Marco? One of a kind. <laughs> go to outside US. So, full disclosure, he's our investor. I, I, I feel like he's concerned about our investment thesis, but uh, I hope that's not the case. Uh, well, primarily because innovation is really happening globally. When my partner launched the first VR accelerator in San Francisco called River, and he did very little publicity, said, we're accepting VR startups. Within the first 10 days, he got 250 applicants around the globe. 250, and for him, this was like aha moment. You know, VR is beyond Silicon Valley because we tend to be very myopic about Silicon Valley. VR is global, right? VR is in Europe, VR is in Japan, VR is in China, VR, VR is in, in Argentina. So we're seeing entrepreneurs from everywhere. For us, we need to go to regions that you have a combination of entrepreneurial activity with the, the local institutional capital. So we can go to a country and, and team up with the local institutional capital and invest in great you know, startups. So I hope you're not concerned about that. And so our real strategy is to team up with a lot of you know, local investors and really find great entrepreneurs. From our perspective, we, you know, I'll talk about three things. One is, if you look at this map from left to right, from bottom to middle, all this hardware input devices, and then the middle part is in a capture camera systems for 360 video. VR fund, we don't invest in hardware. We're too small, we're a $50 million fund, and we're too small for hardware investments. That requires a lot of capital. So our investment really tends to be in the middle level, 
uh, platforms and, and infrastructure solutions, and, and then and top level apps, location-based entertainment, social VR, game, and uh, other entertainment uh, areas, and then and, and enterprise apps, horizontal apps, and also vertical apps. And so that's our investment thesis. And if you look at um, criteria, I think criteria, there's a one element which is a common for all venture investing, as Daniel said, you have to have a great team that complements each other. It's really hard to fund one person teams. You know, you can be incredibly talented, really invest in teams, partly because we really don't know what's gonna happen in the market. When you have, you know, three smart people together or four, whatever, we, you know, we'll rely on you to figure out the market dynamics and find a path because what we think is gonna happen will be different six months from now. So the best venture investment model is put the money behind a smart team, have them sort of figure out the, the, the shifting you know, landscape and provide guidance to help them. We don't like to get involved in operational stuff unless the team needs us. So the, the common elements are team has to be like, you know, at least a starting component, uh, you know, base of the team has to be real solid. You have to have a, a sort of common, you know, big vision to change the world and you have to do something, you know, amazing. For VR, do not come to us or really other investors. If I speak on behalf of Silicon Valley, sort of, there is no appetite for a game company coming and saying, give me two years, I'm gonna build this epic story in VR, I need $5 million. There's no investor interest for it because we don't know if that's gonna be successful, right? So our model is come with a model that you can go to market with an ideally nine months with a maybe vertical slice and you can really sort of fine tune it, improve it and then come back more for more funding. Your funding horizon should be minimum 18 months so that you don't, you don't get on the road after nine months without having achieved you know, critical benchmarks and milestones. So really think about short time to market, be very efficient in terms of capital usage, and get out there and, and really iterate and learn about user behaviors. Don't do epic stories, don't do big budget stuff. Console PC model doesn't really work anymore, at least at the stage of the market. Not one single question? I have a question I have actually a question. To, to her. Okay. And, and you know, Lean and Toma have, have been the amazing drivers behind this landscape, and you looked at over 300 companies. What can you share with us based on your observations and, and perspectives? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, so yes, for the past uh, couple of months, I've been doing a lot of research, but uh, most importantly, I've been reaching out to uh, VR ambassadors across Europe. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, activities happening in different cities in Europe, mostly driven by one or two people. Um, I had a call with him, with him or them, um, to, to find out who are the startups that we would, should watch out for. Um, so this is the first version. Uh, what I was really surprised about is the high number of startups coming from France. Um, and also how well funded they are. Uh, they're in different uh, segments, uh, but uh, I think a couple of them are like Video Stitch and Giroptic are doing quite well in the industry. Uh, another big surprise for me was uh, MindMaze. Uh, it's a Swiss-based company. They raised 100 million. Uh, so that I, I think they're the first unicorn in VR. Yes, so it's, uh, it's amazing for me. I kind of missed that. I don't know how, but now I, uh, I feel like very, very ridiculous on that level. So they're doing um, uh, amazing things in, in input, but you also see them in uh, HMD. Uh, they have a Tether device on the market. Um, what else is super interesting? I think the, yeah, every, every segment has interesting players, uh, but I was also surprised about a couple of Italian ones. Um, I'm not looking at the map. Uh, or a Spanish one, Psyus uh, uh, in healthcare. Uh, really look into them or MD Linking. It started as a, as a social sharing platform, but now they're also integrating uh, virtual reality. So yes, in every segment, there are these are the top of the of the most important players in Europe, uh, doing in unique use cases, not only for Europe uh, but internationally. So uh, we've started doing an uh, analysis on the funding as well, which is not finished, but it's clear that uh, 2015 and 2016 has seen. In, in dramatic increase in funding, and all, not only from local investors, but also international investors like the VR Fund actively uh, scouting in Europe. So I think uh, we have a promising future here in Europe on the level of uh, VR startups. 
No hands. I have a question. Um, Juan, this is directed to you with the EU VR and the interactive database, um, which I'm actually eagerly looking for. Can you describe a little bit of what it will actually offer and why you're using the word interactive? Yeah. So, so we're using a platform called uh, Data Scout. Data Scout has been uh, used to uh, help develop ecosystem of startups and making sure that all the actors are present. So the idea is to have a very visual interface where data analytics is really you know, the core of the experience. So we can deliver value to the startup and organization that registered themselves, because suddenly they're, they're integrating a, a, an ecosystem. And then we can also help all the actors that are you know, uh, looking for you know, making investments or supporting organizations uh, to, to, make it, uh, to make it through. Now we are, we're very happy to have you know partner with Gumi to to be able to help us you know fund this uh, this specific activity, because uh, you know I can totally empathize with the work that Lena has, has has had to go through, because it's such you know an exploded ecosystem. Uh, we hope to be able to uh, ease Lena's life in the future and everybody's life in the future by having this sort of you know one central European uh, uh, overview of all what's being done. I mean, we are uh, parallel to that. We hope to use some of that data to convince uh, our European institution uh, that you know the age 2020 agenda, you know, needs to evolve to also integrate VR and AR. Because if you look right now at some of the technology choices that have been made or some of the focus of research project, there's very little either for VR or AR, and um, there should be more incentive from those uh, European funds to help you know, those companies you know, accelerate uh, their development and rely also on European funding for the expansion. So we are very hopeful. Uh, we are launching um, this database um, mid-March, uh, early uh, April. Uh, you can already go on the UVR, uh, send us your, uh, uh, um, your contact details, and then as soon as the database uh, is becoming available, we'll share, uh, we'll invite you to come and share your data and information. Hi, uh, Christian Sander from Dear Reality, uh, creating 3D audio middleware, and uh, I have two questions. The first is, uh, how did we, how is it possible to get on that slide? I think I didn't. So I think Lean and and Tipitat will sell uh, each spot at ten thousand dollars. You said. <laughs> okay. So really, the, again, the criteria that Tipitat has been using for all of our landscape was that company has to have some funding. They have to have a commercial product that we can sort of point to, and 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 and, and I think some of it. I, I would say 89, 80 to 90 percent of the, the companies on the landscape fit that criteria. There are some exceptions, but again, really apologies if you miss anybody. Send us an email, yeah. and we'll be publishing this periodically. Okay, thank you. So the second question is: we, we're in a funding round at the moment, and we sometimes get the advice um, or the question from um, investors: if if we are already planning to go to the U.S. and um, I, I was wondering what's your idea about that because, I mean, of the costs for engineers and our network is in Europe. So um, I, would, I would like to know what's your opinion about that, if VR companies should go to the U.S. from Europe as to the very, very soon, or uh, what's your idea about that? I think Colopal and us, were exception to the rule. So if you really want to get U.S. funding, you have to establish a corporation in the U.S., so the typical model is you have, to, let's say that you have a parent in the U.S. and make your local company as a wholly owned sub. You can still have engineers here or developers or game designers and everything else, but you have a legal entity in the U.S. that really makes funding much easier. A lot of uh, VCs are, in general, are lazy investors, right? Nobody really wants to know, learn about in other countries, you know, subtleties. So if you have a U.S. entity, it also gives you protection on the IP side. Again, you know, Every country has a different IP jurisdiction. Obviously, European, Europe has a sort of common IP jurisdiction. So to the extent that you really definitely want to raise money from U.S. investors, my suggestion is has, you know, establish a Delaware or a California entity and make everything else to be a sub of that and transfer the IP to that entity and, and get funding through that vehicle. Otherwise, I would say 99% of uh, Silicon Valley early stage investors do not invest in overseas companies. Uh, I'm Cassia Curran from NetEase. Um, in 2016, I think we saw a lot of investment in VR. I think about 
$1.1 billion. Um, and I believe that's about equal to uh, 2012 to 2015's uh, investment in VR. Um, do you think it's likely that we'll continue to see a huge increase in investment in VR in 2017? Yeah, I mean, I'll share my perspectives and, and others can chime in. So 2.3 billion was last year's number. And if you look at, you know, the, really the investment pace sort of started becoming more noticeable in 2014. You know, 2014, 2015, and 2016. The difference is, is really the composition of investors. So 2016 is the year that traditional venture funds started coming into VR, AR investments. 2014 and 2015 were primarily driven by overseas investors. And there's a lot of investors coming from China. And for China, as the, the you know, premier said, VR, AR is one of the core areas of growth. So it's a national interest and national priority. So I, I think there's been incredible amount of money came into the Silicon Valley you know, VR, AR startups in 2014, 15. Toward the end of 15 to last year, the shift sort of uh, went towards traditional venture funds. Excel, Sequoia, Kleiner, and Reason, Lightspeed, Norwest, they're all investing in VR, AR startups. This is really good for the community because you have a disciplined investor and they know the pricing, they know the structure, and, and also a lot of times, for, uh, you know, the investors, especially not established funds like Clopal, they don't do follow-on investments that well. What you need is a patient capital to stay with you, A, B, C, D, E rounds, whatever the numbers and alphabet you go through. So traditional venture funds coming into, you know, VRAR investing in 2016 is a great trend. And I think the forecast is we'll probably double that this year. It was 2.3 billion last year. It should be close to four to five billion this year. So guys, I have a follow-up question on that because uh, Marco, you, are, you also said that you team up with local investors uh, it, and there's a lot of money in Europe, you know, also uh, in uh, traditional VCs. In Paris, for instance, there's ID Invest and uh, Alvin, they're huge. Um, the only thing that I've noticed with the European VCs is that they don't have a lot of knowledge yet. Could you tell us a bit more about your start, how you gained so much knowledge, and are you transferring this knowledge towards European money, because that's what's, uh, or VCs, if you partner up with them? Because that's actually what we could really uh, use from you guys. But yes. Can you give, give us your insight in that, in the knowledge that you build, and transferring that to the European VC system? Okay. so. Uh, I really don't want it to be about us, but I'll give you our brief history. I was running a mobile game com company called Playforce, Diner Dash, if you guys played, and 85% and female audience, and sort of, we, so um, to me the learning was that mobile gaming could be extremely profitable and, and, and also frustrating at the same time, because UA is ex you know, very, very expensive. So after selling that, Tip Tan and I used to work at the same company, and he was you know, unique talent, both creative and, and technical. So he left, and as soon as we got Oculus DK1, our engineering team production went to zero. Everybody was DK, playing with DK1. Nobody could do anything. So Tip Tan says, I'm out of here. I'm going to start, dedicate my life to VR, AR, and he left. And after I sold the company, I joined uh, Evolution Media Capital, which is a part of TPG Capital and Creative Artists Agency. So my in, you know, interest was investing in technologies relevant to content. So I ended up investing in Jaunt. You know, you guys probably heard about Jaunt VR. That was a $65 billion investment in 2015. And uh, again, my learning was that you know, VR, AR will transform our lives. This is once in a lifetime opportunity for us. So both Tip Ted and I, we, we said, we're going to drop everything we're doing. We had no idea what was going to happen. We left our jobs a year ago, started the fund. We got great support from Gumi. Onogi-san is here presenting actually right after this, and our friends at Global. And fast forward, we raised most of our you know, uh, target capital. In the meantime, we've been working with entrepreneurs. And our journey was really coming from gaming, content, media, entertainment, and seeing VR, AR to be very transformative to gaming and entertainment, as well as other aspects of life, healthcare, you know, mental, physical, uh, education, you know, any, I mean, manufacturing, it really touches everything. So we thought this is something we really felt compelled and felt the passion for it. 
And, and now having built uh, uh, you know, 17 uh, sort of company portfolio, we're now looking to work with Daniel and other investors in Europe to invest in entrepreneurs in the, in the, on the continent. Thank you. I think we have to wrap it up and give a little applause to the panel.